So Blessed Ministry Sunday School. I'm so glad you could join us this morning. And when I say us, I mean our Bible Searcher Sunday School class at Friendship Baptist Church, Gary and I, and also our home attendees who joined us this morning. And let me show you who they are. Me and the girls set up a Sunday School class yesterday to get it started and then some practice, and then here's who the one attended. I hope you can see them. I think the glare might be a little off. Marshall's in the front. He brought a little friend with him. You got the babies in the back row, and you got Mary and Martha in the middle. I don't know if you can see it, but they look like they brushed out the house down the road to have a little talk with Jesus. Their makeup is all, all smeared and all over the place. They were excited to get here. They showed up again this morning, and they're ready to study the Word with us. Marshall's tails are wagging. I can see it now. But that's who is here with me in the house, and I, I'm just so thankful that y'all have joined us this morning. We find ourselves in a different situation than what we are usually in, but, but that's okay. We're going to do this as normal as we usually do on Sunday mornings. And for those of y'all who do not know me, I am Christy Bagley. I'm a member of Friendship Baptist Church. I've been teaching an adult Sunday school class for the last, I don't know, four and a half, five years now. And a lot of our members um, are retirees. And during the summertime, they pack up their motor homes and their families and they hit the road for the summer. And, and they miss out a lot on our classes. So we have been trying to figure out a way to where we can all stay together and join in on our studies on Sunday mornings. So what better time than this for us to actually implement a plan and get it going. And I'm hoping to, to keep doing this uh, from now on. Um, I'll be in church when we get back into our, our church facilities on the classroom, but I'm hoping to record some um, lessons and for those of, in our class or whoever would like to join us who's not able to come to church can still participate and join us and not get behind in our studies. I want to give a, a shout out first off to our third in line uh, granddaughter Lucy. Today is her birthday. Happy birthday baby girl. Nana loves you. But before we get into scripture let's Go have a little talk with our Father this morning and tell him good morning. Lord, you know the reason we're gathered in our homes today. You know the situation that we're in and what we're facing. You know what our needs are, and you know what the future holds for us. Father, help us to know we are your church, and your spirit abides within us. Help us to know there is nothing that we face that is bigger than you and that your grace cannot cover us. Help us to know that you are our provider and help us to know more and more about you during the study of your word. Bless your children and bless the reading of your words. In Jesus' name, amen. In our class, whenever we um, start a new book in the Bible, we go through the who's, what, when's, where's uh, of the scripture. It just helps us to get a little bit of better understanding and a better interpretation of what the, the, the author was trying to relate to his readers. And so today, as I said, we're going to keep this as normal as possible, and we're going to keep doing what we've always been doing, as if we were sitting in the classroom this morning. We're going to be in scriptures, 1 John, Chapter 3, 1 through 8, and verse 24. Now, there are three epistles of John. First John is the longest, the second, third, or the shortest. And they were written by the author of the Gospel of John. Now, these epistles, they, they read like a love letter from an elderly saint who has written for many years of the experience with, with Christ and his message. And although it's unnamed, the author addresses his readers intimately as little children and beloved. But however, if you get on down to maybe around verse 7, you start noticing 
a change in his tone when he starts to bear down on his opponents for, for making light of the bodily existence of Christ. These date back to the towards the close of the first century AD, and they were probably written around um, Ephesus or in that area. We done a little, little study uh, several weeks ago in our classroom on the epistles and the letters of Paul. There is a difference in an epistle and letter. We're not going to re-study that again today, but if you would like to, you, you can study that on your own. There is a difference. Um, this epistle, there are no salutations or identification of the author. There's no greetings. There's no references of persons, places, or events. Although its format is impersonal, about like a sermon, its tones is warm and, and personal. And this suggests that it was written brought to a uh, broad audience of people that was very dear to the author. And like the Gospel of John, the, the epistles of John are built on a foundation of love, truth, sin, world, light, life. And it emphasizes the, the, the knowing, the believing, the walking and abiding. And these are simple words on the surface that we use, but, but in the hands of someone like John, who pondered the mystery of the incarnated Christ, the existence of Jesus in human form, they hold deep truths. For John, the main principle of the gospel is that God had appeared in human form. The incarnation is life, and this life is available in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He who has a son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This message of life is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of the epistle. Now, if we were in class, I would be handing out an outline of the, of the verses we're going to be going over, but since we're not, I just want to go over a real quick outline with you, and if you've got your pencils with you, just, just jot it down as we go. If you want to title it, it's going to be a, the, the part played by the Trinity in bringing about our salvation. Now, if you look at verses 1 through 3, we're going to read them in just a minute, but if you want to just jot these verses down, we're going to go back and read them. Verses 1 through 3 shows the role of the Father. Verse, verse 1, he bestows his love upon us. He calls us his own children, and he will someday make us like Jesus. Isn't that not amazing? Verses 4, 5, and 8 shows the role of the Son. He died for our sins. He destroyed the works of the devil. And verse 24 is the role of the Spirit. His spirit now dwells within us. So that is a, a short outline, and you can go back and, and fill in some blanks later on if you need to. And as my class can attest to this, I, I talk with my hands, and I have to move. If my hands was tied behind my back, I couldn't, I couldn't see. But I also like to use imagination to place us right here in Scripture with them. Sometimes if you just close your eyes and just picture yourself in the pages with them, use your imagination. It helps to, to bring it to life, and that's what God's words is. They're living words, and we want to just jump right in the pages with them and experience everything they're experiencing, their pain, their joys, their hurts, their redemption, their repentance. The Savior. And here's a way for y'all to participate in the lesson today. As we are reading these scriptures, I want you to think of two words that describe love to you. What does it look like to you? What does it feel like to you? And if you'd like to share it with us, just type it in the comment box below and share it with others. Also, we always do a prayer request in our Sunday school class on Sunday mornings. We're still going to do that. If you have a prayer request you would like to, to ask for people to pray for, just type it in the comment box. I can't see it now or, or, or recognize it now, but I'll go back later and read them and write those down. 
So go ahead and send in your prayer request also. Let's get to um, verses 1 John. So everybody, open your Bibles, your iPads, your, your iPhones, whatever device that you use to read Scripture. And let's sit down with John and listen as he, see, as he pins his letter to his beloved. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The role of the Father. Behold, John says, what manner of love. You could write volumes based on this verse in the next two verses alone and never exhaust this extraordinary subject that contains within these verses. You can you could just hear John. Beloved, behold the, the love he's pouring out. The apostle himself does not even attempt to describe it. He calls on the world and the church to, to behold it, to look upon it, to contemplate it, and to wonder at it. This is, we've got Easter uh, approaching us quick, and I don't know if we're going to find ourselves back in our sanctuary or if we're going to still find ourselves in the sanctuary of our home. But it doesn't matter. Wherever we're at, I want you to, to remember the, this verse, highlight your Bible. I always tell my class, underline this, highlight this. Let it draw your attention back to this, this verse and, and remember it during, during Easter as you're, you're hopefully taking communion and, and you're pondering the cross and what Christ has done for you. What manner of love does our Father have for us? Hmm that he calls us his children. This realization that, that we are his, as I, as I was doing this study this week, I was trying to come up with a word to describe it. And all I could, kept coming back to me was it's, it's filling. It just fills you up with love, with, with gratefulness, with, with comfort and assurance. Who, who needs that right now? Anybody need a little certainty right now? Our pastor, Ricky, preached his sermon last week was on certainty. And it, if you get a chance, go back and watch it. It was, it was amazing. But we need that today. Beloved, he says, he goes on, beloved. Bless your heart. Can't you just feel the intimacy that John has for his readers? John's word speaks about transforming and transfiguring. Now, he says, now we are the sons of God. He's, he's speaking to those who are begotten of God. Those who have been adopted into the family of Christ. Me and you. And even though we are children of God, we don't yet know what state of glorious acceptance to which we shall be raised. But there's enough to give us hope to sustain us in the trials of our life. And as he continues, but we know that when he is revealed, listen, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Don't that just give you chills? I just got chills running up my arm. What a sight to behold, is it not? A blessed vision to, to see him as he is, divine, holy, glorious. But in the meantime, let us be content to, to look at him by faith and to grow more and more prepared for that brighter vision which is yet to be ours. I want to share with you something that happened years ago. My, my mother passed away in November of 2009. And she was 
bedridden for about the last year of her life and from strokes. And, and right before her passing, God was speaking to me and dealing with me about starting bus ministry at our church, which is going great right now. Thank you, Leanne and Corey and Greta and all the ones dealing with that. But before she passed, he gave me that, that a vision. I'm going to say it was from him. It was a dream that I had, but, but to this day, I know that God blessed me with it because it gave me such comfort and peace knowing that Mother was okay, that he was taking care of her, and I was to go on preparing for my work with him. And I can, I can still vision her right now. He gave me a dream, and we were sitting in our Sunday school class, the one that we have at the church. I know I'm supposed, not supposed to touch my face, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and she walked in, and I knew it was Mother, but yet it didn't look like Mother. She was, she was radiant. She had long beautiful flowing hair which mother never had but it was it was, it was just glorious and she was just shining and glowing and I have treasured that vision and that dream because it gives me hope it gives me hope we don't know what we're going to be when we're raised but we're going on faith and hope this hope of being like Christ it is the divine hope that keeps us and helps us to grow day by day more like him. So we purify ourselves as Christ is pure. Now if I can see the words to keep reading on, oh, we're going to start in verse 4 through 8. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he is manifested to take away our sins, and in him, in him there is no sins. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, John says, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. And he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And for this purpose, mark that down, underline it, highlight it, come back to it. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. There's never been a better definition of sin than this. Sin is a transgression of the law. Now I want us to stop a minute. I want us to focus on, on sin. My sin, your sin, our sin, the world's sin. He came into the world to destroy the power of sin over us, to pardon the guilt and, and to cleanse us from the pollution of it. This was the very design of his manifestation in the, in the flesh. He was born of a virgin. He came down, wrapped himself in flesh. He suffered and died for this very purpose. But he was God, right? How, how are we to be sinless like that in the kind of world we live in? Well, folks, we can't be. But is Jesus not the example that we are supposed to follow? Are we not called to be like him? He, he lived in the same world we're living in. He was closer to sin than, than any of us will ever be, yet he was sinless. What's our excuse? Hebrews 12, 1, you don't have to flip over there. You can if you want. Just jot the verse down. 12, 1 says, Sin ensnares us. It clings to us. We get cozy with it and we get comfortable with it. And it stops bothering us when we sin. But we're not supposed to stay in sin. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, it's just not when we sin. The worst thing about our sin sometimes and getting in that sin pit is when we drag others down in it with us. We are commanded daily to get rid of it. Clean up our temple. It's springtime. Let's do a little spring cleaning that we need to do on a daily basis. Clean, in our, clean out our temple. Get rid of that sin. We have four beautiful granddaughters. And our youngest one, Clara, she's two. She has an older sister, Laura Bell, who's four. Clara confesses her sins and shows no remorse. Her, her dad um, brought them over the other morning. And as soon as they walked in, you see Clara just walking in with that head down. And behind her is her, her older sister. And she's coming in and she's sniffling. And I knew as soon as I saw them what had happened. Clara loves... Laura Bell's hair, long, blonde, beautiful hair. And she loves to take her fingers and just grab a hold and pull it when she's angry with her sister. Well, she did that this morning, that morning, and she got in trouble by her daddy. But she comes in and she tells you, I pulled Bell Bell's hair. I pulled Bell Bell's hair. I said, you pulled her hair? Yeah, I pulled Bell Bell's hair. Okay. Did you tell her you're sorry? Mm-hmm. No remorse. She has no remorse. We're going to have to do a, a, a lesson with her to teach her repentance before long, I, I know. But, but aren't we the same as that? Isn't that just like us? We, we sin, and we sin, and we sin, and we get to the point where our sin, it doesn't bother us anymore. And, and we're able to justify it sometimes. Listen, let's turn to Acts 2. We're going to go to church, folks. With Peter. We're going to Pentecost. The coming of the Spirit. Verse 24. Let me read that before we turn, turn that. Verse 24. We're back in 1 John 3. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost. I've tried and tried to imagine what it must have been like for them. And I can think of only uh, of, of one of those words that would explain it. And to me, this is a, a behold moment that John speaks about. You just have to wonder at it and ponder on it. If I can go back and just jump into any scene in this Bible, and, 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 and there's many, many, but this is one I would love to, to be in the room with them. Something so astonishing, you just, you just have to behold it, to contemplate it, to wonder at it. Verses 1 through 4 in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to him divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to, to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave them utterance. Could you just imagine? The Holy Spirit, it was audible. It was visible. And it manifested itself in a, an outward demonstration of inspired speech. You could hear it. You could see it. You could feel it. I want you just to imagine. Picture with me this. God sitting on his throne leaning over, looking down at the scene, and he just inhales a deep breath. And he just exhales his spirit. And it comes to him with the sound of the mighty rushing wind. 
Oh, my word, church. The Holy Spirit guides us. It leads us. It teaches us. If we listen to him, if we follow him, it will, and allow ourselves to, to learn what he so delights in teaching us. We can feel him. We can hear him. And we can see him. I think Marshall's tail is just a wagon. Two words. That defines love to you. I don't know if any of y'all have listed them or not. But the two words that I kept thinking of is the cross. The cross defines love in all its agape. If you feel hopeless, behold the cross. If you feel lonely, behold the cross. If you think God's not listening to you anymore, that he's just left you, behold the cross. If you're concerned about our future, if you're scared, if you have anxiety, if you have fears, behold the cross. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called his children. Mm. Mm -mm. I want to thank y'all so much for joining us this morning. I'm trying to keep it a, a 30 minute class so y'all can do what you need to and get ready for our 11 o'clock worship service and I hope you join us. Friendship will be live on their Facebook page at 11. Our youngest son, Alex, will be live. He's a pastor at Corinth Baptist Church. He will be live at 11 o'clock also on their Facebook page. Our oldest son, Christopher, who pastors Goshen Baptist Church, they'll be having a service this morning as well. There, there's no excuse, folks, that we still cannot worship our Lord and Savior this day, wherever we're at. We have so many opportunities out there now. There's always, always something good to be thankful for. And I'm so thankful that, that the internet is flooded with God's words now during this time. There's no excuse. Let us go and worship him this morning. I hope that we have prepared ourselves for that worship. And my prayer for y'all is that you will stay hopeful Stay praying and stay in his word. Till we meet again next week. Love y'all.